Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm not quite sure how I fit into the group that's here. But my invitation was to talk to you on the work of Glenn Stoll and future intersecting visions of the Abbey's mission with the UL vision. And then I got three emails to tell me that it should be a quarter of an hour. So I come from an abbey that's about 15 kilometers from here. If you're trying to find it, follow the signs for the pitch and putt, which is just opposite our gate. It's very well signposted. Utopia, as we have been told, is the name we give to that human capacity to imagine and to work for a better world than the one in which we live. That also came with the briefing that we were given. Michael D. Higgins, our president, started the ball rolling, so I begin with a quotation from him. This is from another speech that he gave when he was getting the honorary degree at NUI. Intellectuals are challenged, I believe now, to moral choice, to drift into, be part of a consensus that accepts a failed paradigm of life and economy or to offer or seek to recover the possibility of alternative futures. Monks are those who believe that we are being guided towards a future by a creative spirit which is different from and beyond ourselves. Monks believe that there is a higher power and that close contact with that higher power is essential to any successful implementation of a future which is likely to accommodate in a just and imaginative way the seven billion people who presently inhabit the planet. On our own, we cannot invent a viable alternative future. My talk, therefore, is called An Entomology of Monastic Life. Monasteries, in the imagery of Rainer Maria Rilke, are beehives of the invisible, where honey from the rocks is made available to those with taste buds attuned to such a rarefied diet. World making, whether utopian or otherwise, for anyone who is seriously religious, can only be done by God. That is foundational to monastic life in general and therefore to our way of life in Glenstall Abbey in particular. Our rule, dating from the 6th century, provides a structure which negotiates between the politics of ideology and the despotism of idolatry. Like everybody else, we are thrown into this world without our permission. The German philosopher Heidegger vividly describes our predicament as Geworfenheit, or thrownness, a noun that he invented from the perfect participle of werfen, the verb to fling or throw on the ground. As monks, we cope with this existential reality by weaving with and for ourselves a magic carpet on which we can stand with security. The carpet is the liturgy which forms a space 
time machine on which we can skateboard the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. No one can understand our life as monks unless they recognize that our primary work, the work of God, is holding open four times a day, every day of the year, a space where this other power can enter and be made present in our world. By this work, we create the possibility for the emergence here and now of an alternative world which many refer to somewhat anachronistically as the kingdom of God. But the idea is a world where God is director behind the scenes. Our liturgy enacts a world where the hinted possibilities whispered by the Spirit can be given consideration. It sings the song of a world that is open to such a possibility. And in destitute times, as the poet again says, when politics, economics and sociology, for instance, fail to provide a viable welfare program for our future, we rely on the liturgy as a sounding board for the spirit to help us to see an alternative way forward. Any socialism, for instance, unable to accommodate both God and humankind is socialism too narrow for us. Each one of us in a monastery gives ourselves to such cooperative world construction as one silken thread that believes in the beauty of the total tapestry. Another image of monks who create such a possibility is borrowed again from the world of entomology. Fire ants from the rainforests of Brazil. These tiny creatures finding themselves thrown into a particularly rain-drenched area of the world build rafts made up of themselves. They connect by gripping each other's mandibles and claws as we might lock together with our shoulders to weave a waterproof fabric. Mandibles are appendages near the mouth which were designed to grasp, crush, or cut food or defend against predators and rivals. So such weapons of mass destruction are turned into communitarian safety belts in the interests of survival. One half of the ants cling together underneath in a single layer and the other form a chain mail covering on the top. The result is a two-tiered raft, cohesive, buoyant, and water repellent. The ants underneath survive because the hairs on their bodies are designed to trap a thin layer of air. Small packets of trapped air prevent them from drowning. So that nowadays scientists, I think you'll find this important for your travel problems, scientists building self-assembling flotation devices are studying the formation and technique of the fire ants. And so do the monks 
who overcome their propensity to drown in a chaotic world by forming into a choir and providing a landing strip for the Holy Spirit through the psalms they sing and the air they breathe. Our choir, our chorus, the Greek word, defines an alternative space created between this world and a world beyond, provides the opening through which the Holy Spirit can breathe into this world. So monks become guardians of this source of oxygen for the world. We are a singing people defined by our song. Song is our existence, as Rilke again says. Our liturgy together is the life support machine we have created for ourselves as a body to maintain this continual breathing contact with the higher power. So that is our role in this part of the world and how useful it is to the university, I'm not quite sure. But there are others working too for the reinvigoration of this corner of the planet and we hope that it is helpful for them to have our kind of wellspring within earshot. The number four is often seen as symbolic of wholeness. Its geometric equivalent is the square. There are four points of the compass, four winds around the world, four corners of the earth. And we have here today four presidents of this university, four pillars on which its impressive edifice rests. But the role of the monastery beside you is to recall that the strength of all such four quartets is the fifth person who has inspired the whole of this great development. This fifth person is the Holy Spirit. And I quote from another great pillar of the establishment from an interview that he gave in 1994, which is nearly 10, 20 years ago now. I believe that we could see the rebirth of a distinctive Western chant sound in Ireland. Quite simply, this would come about through an integration of Shano's singing techniques with the received models of chant as they exist in the manuscript sources. We already know more than enough about the operations of the creative process in oral tradition music to allow us to experiment in that direction with chant. I'm talking about linking back to the first thousand years of Western chant tradition before the development of music notation. This process has already begun. The kind of rebirth I'm talking about will not come about solely through academic endeavor, even though such endeavor may be a necessary stimulus and guiding agent throughout the birthing process. The seeds are already sown. 
it simply remains to be seen whether all concerned will be able to continue the process already begun. This last quotation is from Michal Usulwoin in 1994, and it tells of one of the ways in which Glenstall Abbey can and does cooperate with the University of Limerick in a vision for the future. A sound can go forth through all the earth. And perhaps music might provide a way around the impasse of denominationalism in religion, but that would require at least another quarter of an hour to elaborate.